Okay. Okay. Now, now, everyone's getting very excited. Um, I'm told that the US Senator for Vermont is in the building. And It's one of, this is uh, one of those occasions, this is, this is one of those occasions, this is one of those occasions when you say the next speaker needs very little introduction, um, but I'm just going to say, apropos this meeting and its purpose, that today Bernie serves on the Environment and Public Works Committee of the US Senate, he's the longest serving independent Senator in US history. His, his focus is on global warming and rebuilding infrastructure. He's a member of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee of the US Senate. And he uh, also is very involved in pursuing renewable alternatives to fossil fuels. He sits on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committees, uh, where he's fought for greater access to affordable health care and improved education programs. And it gives us great pleasure tonight to welcome Bernie Sanders to address this rally. Thank you. Mick, thank you very much for that introduction, and let me thank the RMT for inviting me to be with you this evening. It is, in truth, a real honor. And I want to convey to you my belief that millions of working people throughout this country are proud of what you are doing. They're proud of your fight for justice, and we stand with you. Thank you. I want to make just a couple of points tonight, and that is to tell you that what is going on today in the UK is no different than what is going on in the United States of America. Same bloody thing. And that is what you are seeing is people on the top, people who are phenomenally rich are becoming richer. You're seeing a middle class continue to shrink and you're seeing millions and millions of people living in abject poverty. In the year 2022, we cannot allow that to happen, whether it's the UK or the United States. Working people all over this globe have got to stand together and tell the oligarchs they cannot have it all. Now, let me tell you, you know, I'm not all that familiar with the politics or the economics of the trade union movement here, but I do know something about what is going on in the United States. And let me tell you a little bit about what's going on in my country. Today in America, you have three multi-billionaires who own more wealth than the bottom half of American society, 160 million people. Three people. Shame is exactly the right word. In your country, as I understand it, you have a hundred people on top who own more wealth than the bottom 18 million people. That is 27% of your population. No one can tell me from a moral perspective, or in fact from an economic perspective, that it makes any sense at all that so few have so much and so many have so little.
You know, in the United States, and I'm sure here in the UK and, and around the world, we deal with serious problems of addiction. We have drug addiction and alcohol addiction and tobacco addiction and so forth and so on. But there is another addiction that the corporate media does not talk about, and that is the horrific addiction of greed. It is beyond my understanding, and I mean this seriously, everybody you know, wants to live a good life, everybody wants to make a good living, everybody wants a decent home, etc., etc. But it is hard for me to really understand how you have people who are worth tens and tens of billions of dollars and who every day are fighting hard to crush the working class so they can have a few billion more shame on them. There is no moral justification for a small number of multi-billionaires to have more wealth than they will spend in a thousand lifetimes while people are going hungry or living out on the street. In the UK and in the United States, we have got to get our priorities right, and that means creating an economy and a government that work for all, not just the few. And it's, it's not only inequality in wealth and income, it is a growing concentration of ownership. Again, the corporate media doesn't talk about this terribly much. But in sector after sector in the United States, and I doubt that it is much different here, you have a handful of large multinational corporations controlling what is produced and how much it costs in one area after the other. And right now, there are three firms on Wall Street, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, who have and control, control assets of $20 trillion. Three companies, that is the GDP of the United States of America. And these three companies are major stockholders in 95% of the Standard & Poor's 500 corporation list. So what you are looking at globally is a small number of billionaires who have enormous power over the economic life of the people and the political life of the people. And our challenge is to bring people together, to stand up to the demagogues who want to divide us up by the color of our skin or where we were born, or our sexual orientation, or whatever. Bring working people together in the fight for justice and a world that belongs to all of us, not just the people on top. It is also important as we engage in the day-to-day -day struggles that the RMT and the other unions here and in America are engaged in, that we also have the courage to think big and not small. Please remember, this is the year 2022. This is not 1922, it's not 1822. We have seen an explosion of technology which would improve life for working people. And yet what we are seeing, despite all of the increase in productivity, is working people seeing in many cases a decline in their standard of living. In my country, in almost the last 50 years, despite a huge explosion of technology where every single worker is far more productive than he or she used to be, what you are seeing today is real inflation accounted for wages are lower today than they were almost 50 years ago. And what we have seen is a massive distribution of wealth going in exactly the wrong way. The middle class is shrinking and the people on top are getting wealthier. Our job is to take on these oligarchs 
And our job is to imagine a world of justice. It is not radical. It is not radical to say that every worker in the UK and in the United States is entitled to a decent standard of living. That's not a radical idea. It is not a radical idea. It is not a radical idea to say that not only should children not be going hungry, that we should have the best schools imaginable, that every young person in this country, in my country, who has the desire to get a higher education should be able to do that without, regardless of the income of his or her family. Not a radical idea. It is not a radical idea to say that at a time when psychologists tell us that zero through four are the most important years of human development, that we have the highest quality and affordable childcare available to all of our kids. In my country right now, as I speak to you, Close to 600,000 people are homeless, sleeping out on the streets of America. 18 million households are spending at least half of their income for housing. It is not a radical idea to say that everybody in this country and in my country is entitled to good, quality, affordable housing. Now, your health care system here is different than ours. And thank God, in 1948, your country had the wisdom to say that health care is a human right, not a privilege. And I understand the pressure and the privatization going on now in the NHS. But you are ahead of us because we, today, have some 70 million Americans who are uninsured or underinsured. And if you can believe it, in my country, the wealthiest country on earth, some 60,000 people a year die because they can't get to a doctor when they need to get a doctor. They can't afford the outrageous cost of prescription drugs because we remain the only country on earth that doesn't negotiate prescription drug prices with the incredibly greedy pharmaceutical industry. So that is where we are today. We are living in a time when we are seeing extraordinary wealth being produced, but it is going to a handful of people. We are living at a time when we are seeing increased pain and suffering for working families, and certainly this inflation that you and we are going through is making a bad situation worse. Our job right now, internationally, is to stand together. Our job right now is to bring people all over the world together, to make it clear to the oligarchs that their day and their power is ending. So brothers and sisters, uh, I really do want to applaud the RMT and the other unions who are now standing up. I want to tell you that in the United States, we are now seeing more trade union organizing efforts than we have seen in a very long time. And I want to tell you that because of the pressure on the working class in America, unions are now now more popular than they have been since the 1960s in the United States. So in America now, we are trying to grow the trade union movement. We're trying to combine trade unionists with the progressive movement to create an economic and political force 
of real power. And I'm happy to tell you we are making real success. We have more strong progressives in the U.S. House of Representatives than we have had in a very, very long time. But I also want to tell you what I know all of you know. Mick was talking about this a moment ago. Frederick Douglass, you know, was the great American abolitionist. And I'm paraphrasing him when he said, there is no success, no justice without struggle. They are never going to give it to you. Do you think the oligarchs are going to say, hey, Mick, you made a good case. We're going to raise wages for your workers. Thanks for informing us what's going on. Do you think the advocates for food security are going to be listened to by the people on top and say, oh, well, thank you for telling us there. People are hungry. People can't afford food. People can't afford housing. We're, we are listening to you. We're going to respond to you. That ain't the way it works. The only way justice ever comes about, the only way working people ever make success is when we stand up, we take them on, and we win. That's what this struggle is about. So once again, Mick and, and trade unionists and, and, and friends, it is an honor, it is a, a, a sincere honor for uh, me to be here. My family is here as well, and we so much appreciate what you are doing. Let me tell you something. What you are doing is being noticed in the United States and around the world. You're an inspiration to people all over this globe. So let us go forward together. Let us go forward together. Let's keep our eyes on the prize. Let's take on corporate greed. Let's transform the world's economy. Thank you very much. is the end of the meeting, apart from, apart from this. Uh, this has been a rally. I know there's a lot of very experienced, intelligent people in this room who've got a lot to bring to the campaign to save London's transport, and we're going to need that knowledge, that enthusiasm, and that solidarity in this room. If we could bottle it, um, we would, but we're going to need that in the years to come. Uh, I'm going to ask you, when you leave here, to please make sure you follow the campaign, Save London's Transport. You can find it via social media. You can find it via the RMT's website. Other unions will also be providing information. Support your picket lines uh, wherever they are. We've just had announcements this afternoon from ASLEF, from the TSSA this morning about future strike action in the National Rail Network. There will be further announcements coming in the next few days. And finally, if you're not a member of a trade union, join a union. Good night, and may you have a safe journey home on public transport. Thank you for coming.